So I've spent a little time talking about computers on my other channel. Some of you may know I'm a software engineer, so I work with computers a lot. The subject I wanted to talk about is files, file types. What do file extensions mean? What is an exe file? Let's get into it. So the first thing I need to mention is the fact that there are two types of files, ASCII and binary. ASCII files are text files, and binary files are files which are in a format that a computer can read and understand. By the way, ASCII stands for American Standard Code for Information Interchange, ASCII. Both binary and ASCII files are made up of ones and zeros at their most basic level. Binary is actually a method of counting. We as humans usually count in base 10, but computers commonly count in base 2. There are other methods of counting for computers, but this is it at its most basic level. So inside the computer are tiny switches, like light switches. They can either be on or off. Electricity is either flowing or it isn't. And these switches usually come in sets of eight. I'm not going to get into how binary works too much, but for now we'll just say that English letters can be represented by the first seven switches. So we don't need the eighth switch for English characters. So a computer can tell the difference between a binary file and an ASCII file based on whether or not the binary sets use that eighth switch. So that's the difference between ASCII files and binary files. Now what's a file extension? You probably see these all the time, .exe or .dll or .png. What does it mean? Basically, a file extension is nothing more than a way for the operating system to know what program to use to run the file. If it's an HTML file, it knows to open it in a web browser. If it's a PNG, it knows to open it in a photo viewer. DLL stands for Dynamic Link Library, and it's basically a set of semi-compiled code that's used by other programs. If you're missing a DLL file that other programs use a lot, those programs won't run correctly. You're going to have to find the DLL file online somewhere and put it where it belongs. Just be careful because it's extremely easy to get a virus this way. Do your best to get it from a trusted source. Computers can take instructions in through a number of different methods. One important way is by compiling the instructions, as I mentioned earlier, which is what produces exe files. It takes code and it spits out a file that can be fed into the CPU for processing. Originally, when programming languages were just getting their start, a language called assembly was very popular. It's basically just a method of telling the processor what to do directly. You have the option of telling it to add or subtract, move this value to this spot in memory, that kind of thing. You could set individual pixels on your monitor to be certain colors. You have a lot of control over things, but there's no higher level functionality with it. It's extremely difficult to build something big and robust in assembly because you're manipulating things on the bit level. But people did it. Pokemon Blue, the Game Boy game, was written entirely in assembly. That is impressive. I don't even know how they did it with a language so low level. Anyways, a new language appeared in 1972 called C. It had something called functions, and it allowed for the engineer to add more complex statements and real structure to the code. You could plan ahead with it. You could create a set of variables and access them anytime you needed them. Create new sets of libraries that other people could use later. The problem with C, and the reason why Game Boy games weren't written in it, is because it had what's called a stack. A stack is an algorithmic data structure. Think of it this way. You have a pile of magazines and you want to order them by date. So you push the January magazine onto the stack. Then you look through the pile for the next one. You push February onto the stack. You can't take one off the stack except off the top. Those are the rules. So when you run a C program, it sets up a function stack in memory. When the first function's called, it creates all the variables it's gonna need and puts them at the very top. Then it starts going through, line by line, running the line of code that the engineer typed in. When another function is encountered, it pushes that onto the stack and sets it up with new variables. Typically, the stack can get very big. It takes a lot of memory and CPU power to store it all. Way more than the Game Boy was capable of handling. Then around 1979, a new language was created called C++. 
This was even more ideal because of the way it treated its code. It had something new called classes, although classes existed in other languages before, but not exactly in the same form as C++ does today. So with classes came the class stack. Classes are basically big data structures that are supposed to represent a real-world object. So if you were writing Pokemon, you'd have the Player class, the Bulbasaur class, the Pokeball class, and so on. Everything is represented within the code. But along with all this representation comes even more overhead. The class stack was even bulkier than the function stack. Not only did it contain a set of variables, but it contained access level data about them, and it also contained sets of functions, just like it did variables. So you're setting up a whole system with this. Anyways, as I was saying, exe files are sets of instructions for how to set up these stacks of data, and the order in which the data is called. That's partly why the larger and more complex a program gets, the more CPU power and memory a computer needs to run it. It's setting up a ridiculous amount of information and behavior to be executed by the CPU. As a side note, you can probably try asking any developer what their most hated error is. It's most likely the stack overflow error. That happens when the stack gets bigger than the operating system can handle. And operating systems can handle an awful lot, so that's genuinely impressive. Actually, operating systems set artificial limits on how big the stack is allowed to get. So when you hit that limit, it assumes there was an overflow. Engineers can increase that limit for their software if they need to. But stack overflows typically happen because an engineer accidentally created a loop somewhere in the program, which made the software recreate a variable, or recall a function, or recreate a class somewhere over and over and over again, until it just couldn't create any more copies of it. Memory leaks. Anyways, that's all I've got for you. Follow me on Twitter, Patreon, Discord, and Facebook. Thanks for watching, guys.